<clears throat> okay, uh, good afternoon. So in today's lecture, I'm going to try to finish the, the caching slides and start um, the next topic, which is paging. Okay, so in the previous lecture, we talked about um, precise exceptions. Um, now let's um, go back to address translation and review what we have seen so far. So initially we talked about um, just page tables and then um, we discussed that just having page table, it's um, not efficient uh, in terms of performance because we're, for every translation, we're gonna go to the memory uh, for a couple of times to just get our address translated. Uh, to speed that up, uh, we added TLDs, so we cached address translations. Now, how can we improve um, performance even further? Well, we can have multiple levels of uh, TLDs, the same way with caches. So we, we added one cache, and then uh, that speeds up your, your execution, but then you can have multiple caches. So if you you miss in uh, cache uh, the first level cache, then you can go to the second level cache. And if you miss in the second level cache, you can go to the third level cache. And, and if you miss in the third level cache, then pr probably you can go to memory eventually. Now with this, the same thing with the, with the TLBs, you can first, uh, for your translation, you can go to your first level TLB, if you don't find it, you go to the second level TLB, to the third level TLB, and then eventually you can go to your uh, page tables. <clears throat> um, so, so, so that's that's pretty much the idea. Okay, so the next uh, the next improvement in in terms of um, in terms of uh, performance uh, is to just use a virtually addressed cache. Now, using it, what is a virtually addressed caches? Uh, virtually addressed caches are caches that are indexed using uh, your virtual address. So, when we started this lecture on caching, um, we talked about how you can use the address of each memory uh, location to find uh, the the corresponding block in your cache. So, it, so the cache that we we saw it was physically addressed because we were using the address of each block in the physical memory. Now you could potentially just use the virtual address to find your data in the cache. Now what's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is you don't need to translate at all. Uh, if, if all you need to find your data is the virtual address, then that's that's great because then you don't need your physical address. Uh, so here is the here is what you can see. Adding a virtual address gives us. So even before we go to t to the TLB to do the translation, uh, we can just get we can just use our virtual address to search in this virtually addressed cache to see if we can find our data. And if we can find our data, congratulations! Like you're the, on the fastest route. Um, because you don't even need to translate your addresses. Now, if you're unfortunate and you can't use, uh, you can't find your data in the cache, uh, in, in your virtually addressed cache, then you're going to go through the, the same process of then uh, translating your uh, virtual address to physical address and eventually going to memory. And so basically going to the memory means here you go to, first level cache, and then you go to second level cache, L2, and then you go to third level cache, and then eventually you go to your physical memory. But then all of these caches here are physically addressed. So you need the you need the physical address to go to L1, L2, L3, and then eventually your physical memory. Whereas this uh, virtually addressed cache uses virtual memory, a virtual address. Now things are not that uh, rosy with uh, virtually addressed caches. Um, the reason is that we have a synonym problem. What is a synonym problem? 
So a synonym problem is a is uh, is a situation where you have two different virtual addresses mapped to the same physical address. Now these two different virtual addresses could be um, could be from the same process or they could be from different processes. So from different processes, this is this is um, this is obvious, right? Anytime you have sharing, anytime you have a shared memory between two processes, there is a chance that each one of them has its own virtual address range for this uh, for this memory region. Uh, and both of them are mapped to the same physical memory uh, region. So this part is is um, kind of straightforward to understand. You might ask, in, under what cases can we get two different virtual addresses from the same process pointing to the same physical address? Now, to, to explain that, I have to explain uh, an example with memory map. So what is memory map? I kind of uh, introduced memory map in the previous uh, uh, previous lectures. Um, so memory map is when you map a file to your memory. And by doing this, you can read from the file or write to the file using load and store. So the general way of reading and writing uh, to and from a file is through system calls like read and write. So you, you, you call a system call and then the operating system manages the read and write to the file for you. And it's, re it's read and written to the uh, permanent storage. Now, this is usually slow because it involves operating system. Alternative to this is to map the file to your memory address space and then start just issuing loads and stores to your memory to read and write uh, to and from a file. The disadvantage of this is uh, if you're writing to the file and the file is in your memory uh, and you get a power outage, all your information are gone. So that's the that's the downside. So I, I, I um, if, if you're using memory mapped files, then you have to take care of the flushing as well. So you have to flush your file uh, uh, maybe frequently to make sure that the, your data is not lost. Um, OK, so now what happens if you do memory map twice? Uh, so this let's assume that this is your address space for process one. Uh, and and this is let's say this is physical memory. So this is virtual memory. For, pro for process one and that's physical memory. So if you do a memory map, what happens is that the operating system brings this file. To to physical memory and then finds you a range of virtual addresses, let's say from V1 uh, from V1 to V2. Um, and maps this to to your file. Now, if you do another memory map, so let's say you call the same, you you do the exactly the same thing. You do another memory map and you get another V1 prime and V2 prime and map it to the same file. This actually can happen. So at, uh, at this point, you have two regions of your virtual memory uh, mapped to the same file. Does that make sense? So now I have like for consider a physical address here, two different virtual addresses are mapped to the same physical address within the same process. OK, so. So somebody is asking, what do you mean by flushing the memory map file? Well, what I mean is 
while you're writing to the file, you're actually not going to the SSD. You're just reading and uh, you're you're issuing loads and stores. So instead of read and write to the file, you're doing read uh, RD and ST instructions to your memory, right? So the file is not being updated. The file is in your memory, not in the storage. So at some point, you have to tell the operating system to to do the synchronization. I'm actually not sure how uh, system libraries do it. So it could well be that the system library frequently does this by itself. Um, so, you know, at some, uh, maybe periodically writes whatever you have written to this file back to the, back to the uh, storage. But if not, then you have to tell the, tell the, the operating system to, to, to do this, maybe in the background to, synchronize the file you have in memory and the and the corresponding file you have in the storage because now you're not actually writing to the storage you're just writing to the to the memory okay so why is this going to be a problem for for synonyms uh, sorry for virtual caches because we can get an, an aliasing uh, problem with the with synonyms, um, here is the here is the here is the problem that could happen. So let's say that this is your virtually address cache. Now, let's consider these two addresses. Let's call this one um, V and this one V prime. So let's say I do two reads my process. Let's say I'm process one uh, and I'm running. So I do two reads. I, I read V and then I read V prime. Um, and let's say because they're, they, they have different virtual addresses, they could be cached in different blocks because they have different addresses, right? So I could cache V uh, and V prime in two different locations in my virtual cache, virtually addressed cache. Now let's say then I do a store to V prime. So let's say I change this from D to D prime. I change the data in for V prime. Now let's say after this, so, so I did a read for V and then I did a read for V prime, then I did a store for V prime and and then I want to do a read for V. So then I go and read V. Why, what do I get? I, I still get D, right? Because what I changed in my cache was this V prime, but then the data here that was changed was not propagated to this V because there is no way that you can do this propagation because from the virtually addressed cache, these are two different addresses. It doesn't have any idea that they're eventually mapped to the same physical address. It doesn't know that if you write to this guy, it has to also go and write to this guy. So, and that's the aliasing uh, problem that we have with, with synonyms. So, the way to solve this is to use virtual address to index into our cache, but to tag each data with the physical address. Does that make sense? So in order for you, for the cache to get to know that these two lines are the same, you have to tag it with the physical address. Now, if you tag them with the physical address, then you can know that these two are uh, are the same. Now, you might ask, okay, so what what was the point of having virtual ad virtually address cache if I'm still needing to have the physical address to tag them? And that's a good question. So, this is kind of like a bummer in terms of performance that we there is no way to just use the virtual address. So, we definitely need the physical address for the tagging. But 
there is a way to speed things up. So what we could do is to do these in parallel. So instead of first translating from virtual address to physical address and then using the physical address to cache, we can do these two in parallel. So we can get our virtual address, access the virtually address cache to find our data. Now, while we're searching the cache in parallel, we could compute our physically physical address. So these two are now being uh, uh, done in parallel instead of uh, being executed sequentially because with physically address caches, we're doing it se sequentially. We are first uh, translating from virtual to physical and then we're going to the cache. Now with this one, we can do them in parallel. We go first to the virtual mem virtually uh, address cache. In parallel, we compute the physical address and once both of them are done, then we check to see if uh, if the data we got is the is is the correct data, right? So so that's that's uh, that's one option. And now this problem, the problem of aliasing happens not just with virtually addressed caches. It actually happens with any um, any hardware uh, storage that uses virtual memory. Sorry, uses virtual address. Uh, one example of such data structure is the store buffer. So the store buffer in x86 uses virtual uh, address um, and the the problem of aliasing happens there as well. So in, in that case, you also need to tag with the physical physical address. OK. So I guess I explained this uh, memory mapped file so we can move on. Now let's put everything together. Uh, so this is what we saw in the previous lecture on address translation. So we have a virtual address. Um, we get the offset uh, to find the particular byte in the page that we're interested in. We then get the virtual address. We divide it into pieces. We use each piece to index into one level of page table and then uh, the next level, and then eventually we get our page, uh, uh, physical page number to get our translation. So this is the address translation. Now in this, uh, in this lecture today, uh, in, in the past two lectures probably, um, we talked about TLBs. So with TLB, we don't need to walk through our page tables. We just go to the TLB and we see if we have a translation for our virtual memory, virtual address to physical address. So that's one speed up that we saw. Um, we also talked about caches. Once we have the physical address, instead of going to memory, instead of going to our actual physical page, we can search the cache first. So we talked about using the physical address, uh, dividing it to byte select, uh, uh, index, and tag to find our data in cache. Uh, and then the, finally, we also talked about virtually address cache. So not only we have TLB, this is one speed up we're getting. Uh, this is the second speed up we're getting. Um, and this is the third speed up that we're getting. OK, now let me do one more uh, speed up. Uh, I think I have a slide for it, but probably th th it's best to do it in this uh, slide uh, with the with the with all these pieces together. So I have to make a point here that where is this page table? So this page table is here in physical memory, right? In reality, page table lives in physical memory. Now. The, the only reason I have it in two pieces is to emphasize that TLB is going to go and search the page table, but in reality, page table is somewhere in physical memory. Now, when you get a miss here in your TLB, where do you go? Do you go to your physical memory right away? Not necessarily. So what happens is when you have a miss, your hardware starts the search. Now, hardware knows the address of page table. Now, the way to look for that 
uh, page table entry is to go to the to the memory hierarchy, which doesn't necessarily mean that first the step is to go to the physical memory. We could actually go to the cache. To the physical cache because we could be caching page table entries here. Right now that we have to go to memory, we're going to go to the memory hierarchy to because page table is part of the memory. So any add I'm going to do, I'm going to issue loads to memory and any address in memory could be cached in 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 the caches in first level and last level caches. So that's why here's the exam. Here's the. Uh, uh, here's a figure for that. So this is where the TLB is. This is where the page table is. Now if you miss in TLB. You don't jump to main memory right away. You're going to go to L1, L2 and L3 and eventually in, to your main memory because there is a there is a potential that you have cached your page table entries in level one, level two and level three. So this is another speed up that we get. And this is speed up comes for free for for address translation because we already had these caches. So when we miss in TLB and we need to uh, look up the page table, it could be that the page table entries are, are cached in, in the caches. So I got a question. Uh, could you give a high level work through of how operating system gets a piece of data from beginning to end using all of the components we have talked about? Um, I guess that would be I guess that would be this figure, right? Um, this figure tells you everything uh, from beginning to end. Um, so this is everything that you need to know. So when you get a virtual num virtual address, when you get a virtual address, you're going to first go and this is by the way, it's not the operating system actually. So it, the question is. I'm going to answer this from the hardware, not operating system. So because the speed up we get is because hardware is doing a lot of things for us. So CPU creates a virtual address. This virtual address goes to the virtually addressed cache to find um, the answer. And as we talked to avoid the synonyms, uh, we might also initiate this translation as well to get the physical memory <clears throat> to check with our to check with our uh, our cache. So you know we here in in here we also want to check it with the physical address. Now if you don't find it in your virtual cache, so you're going to go to your TLB first uh, to see if the address translation is in TLB. If it is, then you get your address uh, and then you go to your caches to see if the data is in your cache. If the data is in your cache, you're good. If not, you go to memory or another level of cache. Now so far, operating system has nothing to do with any of this, so nothing uh, from operating system. Everything is being done by hardware. Now if you miss in TLB, then your your hardware is going to do a page table walk. It's going to go through the page table. Now, eventually you're going to find the page table entry that you need. I mean, hardware is going to do that. So now if that page table entry is valid, then you have your address. So you, you go and access your cache. If it is invalid, this is where the operating system gets in. So if hardware finds that the access is to an invalid page table entry, then it raises an exception and page probably a page fault exception. Um, and then operating system wakes up to see what it has to do. So that's that's basically the 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 flow uh, for every memory access. OK, um, now one last discussion 
about TLB set associativity. See, TLB is a cache, right? Now, we talked about different uh, associativity uh, options for cache. It could be a direct map cache. It could be a, um, uh, a set associative cache, or it could be a fully associative cache. Now, if you look, if you look at this formulation, in this formula here, this is the average memory access time for your TLB. So it has a heat time plus miss ratio times miss time. This is obviously the common thing that we have seen for any cache, TLB included. TLB is a cache, so it has a heat time, miss ratio times miss time. Now, you're going to pay this cost for every access because every access to memory has to have a translation. So every access to memory is going to go to through TLB to get the translation. So this heat time here, heat time for TLB is a time that you're going to pay for every access to memory, as, as, assuming that you don't have the virtually address cache. So you might think that, OK, so this heat time in TLB is a, is a constant cost that I'm always paying, so maybe I should bring this cost down as much as I can. Now, among different options of associativity, direct map cache, uh, um, let's say M-way set associative, and then fully associative, which one has the high, which one has the lowest heat time? Well, if you remember, direct map caches are the simplest ones, so they have the lowest um, heat time. And fully associative caches are the most complex one, and they have the highest um, uh, heat time. Because, because it takes time to find your data in a fully associative cache, so heat time is high. So your first instinct might be, OK, I care about this heat time because I'm paying this cost all the time. So maybe I want to bring this down as much as I can. So if I have these options, maybe I should pick the direct map cache and I'm, I should make my uh, TLB to be direct map cache. Now, is that a good option? The answer is no. The reason is with direct map cache, your miss ratio is very high. So this with direct map cache. Your heat time is low, but your miss ratio is very high because you, you, you don't have a lot of flexibility. Um, you have a lot of conflict misses because every, like each um, address is mapped to a single block and you're going to evict one for the next one that comes uh, you, because you don't have any other options. So the miss ratio is really high because you're going to uh, evict people all the time. And this miss time in TLB is huge because you have to go to your page table, right? If you miss in TLB, you're going to pay a really high cost. So although direct map cache gives you a low heat time, but because miss ratio is high um, and the miss time is really high, overall it's going to give you a really bad average access time. So usually in, in systems, TLBs are um, fully associative. This gives us a slightly higher heat time, but significantly lower miss ratio. So we won't be paying this huge cost a lot. So we bring down the percentage of times that we need to pay this huge cost. And the we pay that uh, extra cost of heat time, but it's fine. So this is for fully associative caches. OK, now the one of the one of the other discussions we have to have is are TLBs all the time useful? Um, now, one thing I have to note is TLBs are very uh, small, so these are really uh, small caches. Um, in you know, 
maybe bigger biggest ones are 256 entries so they can only store 256 addresses address translations they don't have a lot of huge space now let's assume that you have this um, hd display high definition this display let's say a 4k display that keeps 32 bits per uh, pixel and it has 4k times 3k pixels so this is this is just a uh, a normal 4k display this means that for every frame that you want to refresh you have 48 megabyte of data to be sent to your um, to your display now the data that you're going to send to your display is going to be in the memory, right? You're going to write to memory and then your display is going to read from memory. Um, I mean, it's not exactly like that, but but you get the you get the idea. You have to, you know, write uh, the pixels somewhere. Um, and this is like 48 megabyte. Now, Let's assume that each page is 4K. So 4 kilobyte per page. This is going to be 12K pages. So you have 12K uh, pages. This means that you have to uh, you have to translate 12K virtual to physical addresses. Now your TLB only has 256 entries. It cannot store all these uh, all these translations. So what happens is that TLB is just adding overhead because we're never hitting in TLB because by the time you get, so you start with this guy and you don't have the address maybe, so you cache it. By the time you get to uh, entry 256, you have to push this guy out to uh, store this one. And then the, by the time you come back to zero, you don't have that address anymore in your TLB, so you have to cache it again. So basically TLB is not helping you at all. There is nothing in the TLB for translation. So this is, an, this is a problem. Now, how can we address this problem? One way to address this problem is through uh, introduction of uh, super pages. Now, if you remember, we I spent some time telling you about different levels of cache, different levels of page table, and how much memory each one of them covers. So this is page table level one, page table level two, page table level three, page table level four, and eventually you get to your page. So this is your physical page. So this is four kilobyte. Now, any entry in page table level four covers four kilobyte every entry in page table level three covers uh if you remember two megabyte and every page table uh, entry at level two covers one gigabyte so the idea of super page is to bypass uh either page table level four or page table level three. So by bypassing, we're going to just point to the beginning of a huge page of one megabyte, sorry, two megabyte, if it is from P3. And we're not going to use this guy. So we're going to say this is a huge page, so it's not going to be pointing to a 4K page. It's going to be pointing to a two megabyte page. Or in P3, it's if we bypass, it's going to be a even huger page of one gigabyte. So we're going to bypass P3 and P4. Now this is this is how we're going to ju just uh, uh, address the problem that I that I described in the previous lect in the previous slide. So if you have let's say you know uh, this many pages so this is 48 uh, megabyte this could be translated to uh, 
um, 24 uh, huge pages. Each one of them two gig two megabyte, right? So instead of having 12k pages, I ended up with 24 huge pages. Now 24 huge pages, I can I can fit them in my TLB. So that's that's fine. So that's how we do it. So to support this, however, we need to just add some extra uh, information to our TLBs. Uh, both to TLB and also page table, basically in page table entry to indicate that uh, to indicate that we have huge pages. So these are not normal pages. I got a question. How did you one gigabyte and two megabyte? What is that question? I don't even get the question. How did you one gigabyte and two megabyte? If the question is how did we get to these numbers, so um, we discussed them. Um, so if you look at this, uh, this guy is uh, four kilobyte. I, I pre I'm pretty sure we discussed this, but to just this is four kilobyte, right? Now this page table here has two to nine entries. Each entry points to four kilobyte of uh, data, so this becomes two megabyte of data. Now, any uh, entry um, here, so we have um, not any entry here, but in this page table, you have two to nine entries. Each entry points to, as we saw, two megabyte. So this is one gigabyte. So basically any pointer here that points to a page table. Now this entire page table covers one gigabyte of data. This entire page table covers two megabyte of data. And eventually here we have only a single page, which is four kilobyte of data. So that's how I one gigabyte, two gigabyte and two, two megabyte, if that's the question. OK. Do, 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 do. OK, so last uh, topic that we're going to discuss is the topic um, that has um, something to to uh, to security. So um in linux the virtual address space for each process uh is limited so in the in the 32 uh, bit virtual address layout the kernel keeps the addresses from c0000 to 0fffff for kernel so if your process wants to access any virtual address in this range it will get a page fault because uh, because it, it's not supposed to um, it's not supposed to access this range. It, this range is um, reserved for kernel. So if you remember in page table entry, there was a bit that was for kernel. So it was kernel or user, right? So so for these pages, the, the bit is set to one to indicate that this is a kernel page, so the user cannot access this page. Now in a 64-bit system, this has increased to 128 terabyte. So in 32-bit system is one gigabyte of virtual address um, um, being reserved for kernel and three gigabyte goes and the, upper, the, the user program can use it. In uh, in 64 bit, um, 128 terabyte is given to the user, um, and then you have this empty space that we talked about. Nobody can use. Uh, and then 128 terabyte is used by kernel. Now you might ask, why? Why are we um, mapping? 
kernel user space, sorry, kernel virtual space to every process uh, in, uh, in our system. Now, the answer to that, that question is, um, the, the benefit of this is for system calls and interrupt handlers, uh, you're running kernel code, right? And kernel code uses kernel virtual address space. Now, let's say you run the kernel code and you populate um, the you populate your TLB and then you context switch and your new process starts kicking everything out from TLB and bringing its own virtual space, virtual addresses to TLB. And then let's say a system call happens or a, an interrupt happens. Then for the operating system, we don't, we no longer have the translations in the TLB because they're all pushed out by the new, by, by this context switch and the new process populating the TLB. So all of the translations are gone. Now, by mapping the kernel to everybody's virtual space, we make sure that kernel addresses are not pushed out of TLB because they, they're all mapped to the, to the same range on all processors. So this speeds up kernel code uh, execution dramatically because as I said, uh, there's no competition for those ranges of addresses across different processes. So if you cache them in your TLB, it's going to sit there and it, it's going to be accessible across the board, even if you context switch. So that's the that's the upside of this. Uh, it really uh, helps with with running kernel code uh, because it unifies it across all processes. What is the downside? The downside is the security risk. Now, if everything was um, perfect, if the hardware was perfectly implementing whatever it's supposed to do, then this should pose no security risk because of this bit that I just talked about. I can just set this bit to uh, one and uh, block every access from user. So the memory of the kernel is safe. Nobody can access it. Now, unfortunately, hardware is not uh, doing what it should be doing, and it has introduced side channels. So all the, the uh, optimizations that we have done in our ha hardware to make the execution faster and faster, unfortunately, they are leaky and they leak information. And these information have been used in uh, separate attacks uh, in Meltdown and Spectre in conjunction with, with this um, uh, mapping of uh, kernel address space to, to user uh, address space to compromise the kernel memory. So basically both of these two attacks can read the entire memory uh, of uh, of your kernel. So let's. Uh, I'm going to walk you through these um, these attacks uh, because I think they're interesting. So the, the I'm actually just meltdown. A Spectre. I do, I won't have time to to um, talk about it, but just meltdown. <clears throat> um, so we talked about. Uh, I think it was the previous lecture, we talked about um, uh, speculative execution. So um, if you remember, we had this multiplication and then there was a branch not equal. And after branch not equal, we had a load, right? And then I mentioned that this branch not equal, we probably don't get to know the result of this, this branch not equal instruction until this multiplication is over. So the hardware, in, in out of order execution, assumes that this branch is either taken or not taken. Let's assume that it assumes that it's not taken. It predicts that this branch is not going to be taken. So the hardware goes and executes this load. Now this execution of this load is a speculative because I predicted and I started executing. Now later on, if this branch turns out to be uh, not taken, 
or taken whatever we predicted the the opposite of it then it's okay so i can just throw away roll back my execution i can throw away all the things that i thought um are going to be executed and and start over from wherever i need to execute so this is out of order execution this is a speculative execution um and we talked about this rollback right okay now this out of order execution costs us a lot. So here is an example where this is going to cost us. So this is a meltdown. Meltdown was announced in 2018. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, before they announced it to the public, they actually went to Intel and they told Intel that, look, we have found this bug in your processor design and it's a serious bug. Can you fix it? Is how, how is it going to go? And then Intel is like, no, nope, there is nothing we can do. So within a few days, then they released it to the public. So the public knew about it. Um, now, it also impacted um, IBM uh, power architecture. It also impacted many of ARM processors. Um, some, somehow magically it wasn't impacting AMD, so AMD uh, processes were safe uh, from uh, from meltdown attack, but uh, the fun was uh, short for AMD because then the Spectre attack came and then with the Spectre attack all processes were impacted. Um, now how is um, meltdown attack working? So it, it's actually a very short code for meltdown meltdown attack. And it's based on the, this uh, idea of a speculative execution. So there are, each character has eight bytes. So we have um, for each word in memory, uh, for each word in memory, we have, uh, sorry, for, yeah, for each word in memory, there are 256 different uh, options, right? So, mm -hmm. For every option, I'm going to have one uh, one variable, one character here. So I'm going to have this array of zero, um, then array of one times um, 496, 4, 4096, and then array of two times four zero nine six. Now the reason I'm multiplying by this four zero nine six is to make a space between these so that they don't um, they don't fit into the same block. So if you remember, cache block is not just one byte. Cache blocks are bigger than one byte. So we just multiply by a big number so that there is enough enough space between these. Um, between these variables not to be mapped to the same block because we want each one of them to be in a separate block. Now you will see why that's important. So all the way to array 256 uh, or 255 uh, times 4096. Okay, now each one of these guys is going to represent a single eight bits. Right, so each one of them is going to represent a single word of memory because there are 256 different uh, words uh, for eight bytes. Right, if I have eight but if sorry, if I have eight bits, a single word is uh, eight bits. So eight bits. And I have 256 different words, uh, right? So I can, in every eight bits of memory, there are 256 uh, different options to be stored. And I'm, each one of these arrays is going to represent one of those. Okay. Now, again, we are multiplying by this 4096 to just space them um, and make sure that they're in different blocks of cache. Now let's assume that there is a function that can flush your cache and make your cache empty. 
So I'm assuming that this function exists. Now, there are different ways to do this. I'm not going to talk about it, but there are ways to make sure that you empty your cache. So it's usually you go through an array of a uh, huge length um, and you go through it a bunch of times to make sure that everything is pushed out of the cache. Very, sim very similar, let me go up. It's very similar to this, uh, to this, to this example that I, I, I talked. So if you cache this, cache this, cache this, cache this, all the way here, then when you come here, then you're gonna evict every, everything else, right? So if you go through a huge range of addresses, then you can make sure that your cache is uh, clean, like um, from whatever was in, inside it. So you, you're flushing your cache. So that's the idea. Um, there are different ways to do it, so I'm not going to talk about it. So assume that that exists. So you can you can flush your cache. So that's that. Now here comes the here comes the magic of uh, of a meltdown. So this try and cache tr try and catch is basically a uh, a signal handler. So the reason I'm using try and catch is not the try and catch that you use for your exceptions. This is basically your uh, your um, registering this uh, signal with the operating system. And this signal happens when you have illegal access. So when you have segmentation fault, the operating system sends you a signal, uh, the segmentation fault signal. Uh, you can register that with the operating system and then tell operating system, don't kill me, just run my uh, exception handler, so my signal handler. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to make sure that the that our program is not going to be terminated when we get a page fault or a segmentation fault. So that's that. Then I'm going to read the memory, the kernel memory. Now, Obviously, this is going to end in a segmentation fault because I, I don't have access to this kernel memory. Obviously, it's kernel memory, so it's it's going to uh, send, a, send a signal and I'm going to get out. So nothing to be seen here. Now, in reality, this single instruction is divided into um, multiple uh, instructions, right? So one instruction is to actually go and read it. One instruction is to check the uh, permission for this. Um, and and there might be some other uh, instructions associated to this. So this is not going to be executed in one cycle. It's going to take a couple of cycles and it's going to do a lot of stuff. So it, there are going to be micro instructions to deal with this single load, right? Now, the next instruction in line is to read one of these characters. Which one? I'm going to read the result. So whatever was the result, whatever was written in the kernel memory, I'm going to pick that and read it. So I'm going to read that address. OK. So Obviously, if you if you, we had a in order execution, this line should not be executed, right? This line should not be executed because the previous line raises an exception. In out of order execution, this this single line is going to be executed in bunch of different micro architect micro instructions, and then I have this read, um, sorry, this read uh, for this array, right? And this could happen in between these guys. So maybe the first one goes and reads the memory. Then this guy gets uh, reordered and uh, executed out of order. And then maybe next I'm going to check for the, for the permission. And eventually I'm going to raise an exception. Now this is fine. Uh, because then I can just roll back this instruction. Now rolling back this instruction means that I'm not going to make this dummy uh, have this um, uh, variable, but 
what about my cache? So if this instruction has been executed out of order, the side effect of this is that in my cache, now I have cached this guy. And it's fine because cache is a microarchitecture. It's not architecture. It's not a register. It's not memory. So who cares if it is in the cache? So I get an exception. I get the segmentation fault. I start running my, uh, my signal handler, and I get out of this. Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to go through all possible characters from 0 to 256, and I'm going to see how long it takes to read these variables. Now, if the variable is the result, if I equals result, then this um, array is cached. So I'm going to read it really fast because it's in my cache. If I is not equal to result, then I'm going to go to memory. So it's going to take a lot of time. So if I can kind of um, time my accesses, then I can figure out which one of them is cached. And when I get the, the fastest read, I know that I is equal to result. So basically, I figured out what, what was uh, stored in my kernel memory. Now, if I do this for, all, for every single byte of kernel memory, then I can just read the entire kernel memory. So that's how it works. Now, I just read one byte of, uh, of uh, kernel memory. OK, so, so that's that. Um, one way to avoid this is uh, to have uh, kernel page table isolation. So this was a patch that was added to kernel. Uh, basically, what it did is uh, it did not. Um, it's basically kernel stopped um, attaching its address space to all processes. So. In newer versions, what I showed you in the previous slide is not the case. So, so this one is no longer valid in new kernels. So this is not what you see in new kernels. The operating system doesn't match, doesn't um, uh, attach its kernel address space to every processes because of this. So this patch was uh, was introduced. Now, in some cases, it actually uh, caused a slowdown of eight, uh, eight hundred percent, so eight times as slower. Because you know, for for your uh, kernel functions, you now have to do the translation as well, so it makes it a lot slower. Now, unfortunately, with um, with meltdown, sorry, with a Spectre, there is no kernel patch, so there is no software fix for a Spectre. So for Meltdown, you could mitigate the problem by using this patch, but for a Spectre, there is nothing. So a Spectre actually is um, uh, is a smarter than this this one. So and it's like few lines of code and you should probably with the with the explanation that I provided should be able to understand it. So if you're interested, go and look at the Spectre attack. It's a bunch of lines of code. It's very similar to this one. Um, and again, it doesn't have any software fix. So if you have a processor that you bought before 2018, or if you have a processor that was designed before 2018, uh, the chances are that your processor is uh, vulnerable to a Spectre. OK, so that's that. So um, I'm glad I eventually finished uh, finished uh, caching. So from the next uh, uh, on Tuesday, we'll start talking about um, paging. Take care, be safe. We'll talk to you later. Bye.